let me revisit. The PyTorch is one of the widely used library in the neural network and deep learning research. So the other one is TensorFlow, also very powerful, right? Uh, and these libraries, like you, you already know uh, how to use scikit-learn, right? Scikit-learn is very uh, rich library also that has a lot of uh, ready to use or implemented machine learning uh, models, algorithms, support such as support vector machines, logic regression, linear regression, uh, and many others. It's uh, quite rich. So also uh, as, as scikit-learn, even so it allows you to use Multi, I mean, multi-layer perceptron, you can use uh, also like it learn to train simple multi-layer perceptrons, simple neural networks, but it doesn't scale to a case where we are dealing with a big data, okay? So PyTorch, okay, is library also specifically designed for neural networks, but also can be treated as numeric computation, just like NumPy. We know NumPy, right? NumPy is written uh, in C, Right, C++, which allows us efficiently perform the linear algebra operations, matrix multiplication version, and many other things efficiently, very fast. And uh, at the core uh, of NumPy lies this um, n-dimensional array, which stores data, right? And then we can perform. But PyTorch is also similar, can be treated as similar. We are dealing with so-called tensors. Tensor is a, okay, in simple terms, it's another name for array, n-dimensional array, okay? It's a generalization of you know, uh, n-dimensional array or generalization of matrices, et cetera. So uh, for example, here, um, what we have, this is a simple structure of the neural network, right? We have input, right? Bias, our input consists of, right? Two features, x1, x2, and then bias term. And we know this is our weights, sum, H, our hypothesis. Okay, this is summation. After that, we have F of H. What is this? This is a perceptron, right? We can think of this as a single perceptron, just graphically, right? So mathematically, it looks like this. The output is, okay, equal to F of in a product between our input and then weights plus bias. This is what we have. Again, we know this, this is simple perceptor. Graphically, we visualize this. And in our neural network uh, lecture, we, we have um, seen that if we combine several perceptrons in specific order, in some um, graphical order, we can build more uh, complex, let's say model called neural networks, right? Elementary, which, which uh, elementary building blocks of which consists of perceptrons. All right, so, and uh, look, now, yes, this is an example of two perceptrons. I'm just saying this perceptron, but uh, in neural network, we call them as a nodes, okay, H1, H2, or neurons sometimes, but basically this, we have uh, input, um, summation, and passing through some activation function. Activation function is here, let's say, uh, F, simple step function, or linear function, and, when we combine them, we, we, we build this kind of um, simple structure. So we just stack them up. So what we have here is number of hidden units. Okay, hidden unit, unit. Also, yeah, this is also called as unit. Hidden layer, okay, we know. Well, uh, hidden, I mean, uh, hidden unit of, hidden unit, uh, hidden layer one, and hidden unit second of hidden layer. Okay, the same hidden layer. Input layer, hidden layer, output layer. So we can, uh, represented as number of inputs, okay, and the number of hidden units. So we can add more hidden units and we're just basically building, let's say the array of weights that will be multiplied, that, that will be taken, uh, okay, here as shown here in the, in the product. Input, first hidden unit, second hidden unit, third, fourth, it's up to us, right? So this leads to a kind of nested structure. So F1 of, look, this is, uh, our input and then these are, um, okay, weights of the hidden unit and then second hidden unit, okay. And then we will have this kind of structured message. We know them. So is it clear so far? Any question?
All right, tensors. Tensors, as I said, is another name for uh, n-dimensional arrays or objects that store, let's say, data, right? Or matrix, matrices or vectors. So for example, here, this is just n-dimensional arrays. So tensor of, because uh, that consists of vector, this two-dimensional tensor, and then these are three-dimensional tensor. So tensor is just uh, object that holds our data. Okay, this could be your RGB, right? The image that each entry corresponds to pixel values. This could be, okay, if you have uh, third, no, this uh, grayscale, this could be RGB, right? Or red, green, and then blue, if you have the third dimension. Anyway, it's an object that holds your data. So in computer science, people, okay, to use this terminology tensor, but in mathematics, they use the ND array. Uh, you know, it's uh, all about the terminology. So easy uh, way to understand this PyTorch is like treat it as NumPy, kind of library similar to NumPy, uh, but that we can use it on uh, graphical processing or so on GPUs. For example, NumPy, okay, we import torch and then random, generate random, uh, random data, okay? Very similar to NumPy. We, uh, in NumPy, we can also generate NP, right? Um, random, okay, random, okay. I think it should be like this. Oh, okay. So in uh, NumPy, we can generate random, right? Arrays using this random and then rand. Okay, it depends. Uh, in Torch, in PyTorch, we can also use uh, this kind of function. Once, okay. Uh, in NumPy, we can also use NP ones. NP ones, if yeah, right. Um, similarly, yes. And we can add two tensors, right? X and Y. So. Very similar, and the indexation is also very similar to uh, NumPy, similar to NumPy, and also yeah. So basically, the first way to you know to uh, in learning PyTorch is just imagine you know, treat it as like an extension of NumPy or similar to NumPy, library similar to NumPy or module. Yeah, so there are two different type of methods. One of them is in place addition, which is followed by z at underscore one underscore, right? 10 performs in place addition, right? Uh, this is uh, add one and uh, create a new tensor. Very sim simple. Okay. All this uh, reshaping also similar to NumPy. I just quickly go through. Yeah, NumPy here. Yeah. NumPy random. And then we know let's create first a NumPy array. And then from NumPy, we can create a torch tensor. So PyTorch tensor from NumPy A, okay, convert NumPy A to Torch. Very fast, very, uh, very efficient. And from tensor to NumPy, we can simply use b.numpy. So we get back to our NumPy uh, array. So why we may need to use this? Okay, most of the data in Python ecosystem or world is, most of the data, right, is stored as a NumPy array, right? And if you want to use some kind of deep learning library, you need to first convert that into the format that is usable by specific, uh, let's say, deep learning library, in this case, PyTorch. So converting from NumPy to PyTorch tensor is straightforward. And from uh, PyTorch to back to NumPy is also straightforward. So it's very efficient. Yeah, memory shared between NumPy and tensor, uh, torch tensor. So if you change the value in, in place of one object, the other will also uh, change. 
yeah, and um, we can build a fit for neural network. So Torch Vision is another sub module of PyTorch, which has a lot of useful functions for performing, uh, for working with image data, computer for computer vision applications. So basically, this is a library for uh, dealing with images, videos, and etc. Yes, um, so the compose uh, is a method that allows us to perform uh, some specific uh, operations on our tensors, which is, for example, normalization. So any state set uh, we can download and yeah, uh, we can have this data loader, another thing that allows us to, per I mean, to perform some batching. is our image and building the neural network, right? So this is a multi-layer perceptron input 784, okay? Because of the dimensionality of these. And hidden layer one, hidden layer two, output layer. And then we have, let's say, cross entropy, final loss layer. We, we can calculate the loss. We talked about sigmoid, hyperbolic tangent, and we didn't talk about like the fight linear unit, but it's also another activation function widely used in neural network. So very similar, look, f of x zero for all negative values, okay, of x. It just uh, removes all the negative assigned zero. And all positives are passed, so here. This is another activation function. And now building the neural network, usually in PyTorch, we use classes to wrap up our uh, new perceptron, a multi layer perceptron or neural network model. So, neural, we create network, for example, uh, PyTorch NN module uh, uh, contains a lot of useful, again, functions for building linear layer, uh, convolution layer, and other things. So, we inherit from NN module some of the things, okay, and then define the constructor. And this is, you know, we inherit uh, properties of our parent class object. And uh, first layer, look, this is a definition of three layers. So, and then linear builds these linear layers. Okay, so input, we define input. This is input and this is output. Okay, this is the output 128. And this input, output again. This is input to the second layer, hidden layer, and then output will be 64, from 64 to 10. 64 to 10. MNIST is a 10 class classification data. We're dealing with uh, digits, right? 10 digits, handwritten digits, so output will be equal to 10. So this is the constructor. And uh, the forward method basically pass, passes the input data through layers. Okay, these are input. First layer, fully connected layer, and then we apply a rectified linear unit, this activation, and second layer, second layer, okay? And then another activation, uh, <clears throat> and this is a final layer, and we return the X. And uh, look, this predict also uh, will be used later on after uh, training is complete. So we predict, we this is a test data, uh, we pass, this, yeah, I mean, this is um, input and uh, we are applying softmax, softmax. And we can instantiate the neural network as follows. So basically, everything that you define, every neural network architecture that you define in Python should be wrapped in class, okay, as a class object. So this is an example. Yeah, weight initialization, we talked about it. Why, what's the importance of weight initialization? In Islam, can you tell me? Sorry, do you know? If we initialize them incorrectly, there may be some problems updating them. Mm -hmm. All right, and 
And so, do you know what's the importance of initializing the weights in neural networks? Uh, if you initialize weights correctly, then we can get uh, the results more closer with um, less error. Exactly. Yes. Uh, yeah, both uh, both answers are correct. So, uh, in neural networks, we are, we are optimizing uh, non-convex objective function. That means we will deal with multiple local minima, right? So it is very easy to get stuck in somewhere, you know, because we're using gradient descent to minimize somewhere in local minima, right? So if we initialize the weight in a way that will take us to the, to the, I mean, closer to the global minimum, probably uh, we can minimize, we, we will be uh, getting a model which will perform better, right? With, let's say, smaller in sample error. And uh, usually, <clears throat> look, before training the neural network, we need, these are connection nodes, right? These are, uh, these lines are the weight parameters. They are, they can, there are, we can have several options. We can just leave them all, um, let's say, some random value or constant value or, or a value that will, again, uh, allow us to apply gradient descent from a closer point to the global minimum. So important, it is very important to find uh, uh, the weights, okay, initial weights. That will, again, uh, give us a <clears throat> chance to come closer to the glo uh, global minimum. So yeah, well, so this is a neural network. These are net. Uh, object that we instantiated, fully connected. Fully connected, FC stands for fully connected. Fully connected is basically feed forward neural network layer. It's a terminology used in neural network research, fully connected layer. And we, we will see later, I mean, there are other types of layer like convolutional layer to, to make it separate. So weight is located here. So these are the weights, bias, okay, of fully connected layer and then We can fill the uh, bias like to zero, all zero, or all ones, or some random numbers. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, we can also um, buy some weight initialization using some, uh, according to some, let's say, uh, normal distribution. So the forward pass will consist of getting the images from our MNIST data. Okay, resizing it. So we have, right, uh, this is the batch size, 64. This is uh, uh, depth. We are, we're dealing with grayscale, so this will be one. And this will be the flattened out uh, pixels from 28 by 28 image. And, um, you know, the variable allows us, we need to use this variable module, but nowadays it is incorporated in the PyTorch, it's hidden, but in the earlier versions, we need to clarify, this is variable, we want to make sure that we store the gradients of uh, our network on this. Basically, uh, auto differentiation is another so yeah, we, once we get input, we can pass through our net network, forward pass, get the output, and then softmax, and yes, so we can see. So in this example, what we have here is we're passing nine to our through our network that is not trained. So the output the, the output is a softmax, so it basically gives a probability of one of these digits being uh, input. So here, because the network is not trained, we are passing through some untrained um, neural network with random weights, all the probability of nine is very similar to all, okay? This is not correct. So after training the neural network, all right, the probability of nine should go up here. And we train this network using, uh, okay, this back propagation. 
So <clears throat> mm -hmm. So yeah, we know about that location. So Autograd, what is Autograd? This is a module in PyTorch, which, which calculates the gradients of the tensor automatically. Autograd means automatic gradient calculation. Okay, so it also keeps track of operations performed on our input data on tensor, all right? Uh, because we are using chain rule in backpropagation, on, on all operations that has been done on input, so we need to keep track of what has, what kind of operation has been done to the data. So, okay, yeah, we need to wrap our tensor in with a variable so that it tells, okay, to PyTorch or Torch that we want to keep track of all the operations that has been done on the tensor, right? And also we can get the tensor, okay, from this data, okay, attribute. And, uh, okay, Z backward, let's see. So there is another function called Z backward, which means basically perform backpropagation, pass backward, okay, backward pass. So again, then by PyTorch neural network, and then this optum from Torch import optum. Optum is the module uh, that has is all this optimizer, Adam optimizer, for example, or Add a grad, many other optimizers that we can use. <clears throat> and F uh, torch and then functional F contains some useful functions, such as helpful functions, uh, softmax, for example. So variable helper, okay. The ones, and then let's uh, wrap it with a variable, right? This variable class that we say that we want to keep track of all the operations that has happened to the X by you know, wrapping it with variable and then saying that we need the, the calculator the, uh, gradient. So we set it to true. So for example, now let's perform some simple operation now. X, X plus one, okay, uh, power of two and three, right? So this is uh, some operation. Now, if you take a look at, okay, this is output, output. <clears throat> so yeah, this one, for example, can see some information. Uh, what has happened to the data? So the last operation is multiply. Mol stands for multiply backward. Okay, grad fn shows a function that generated this variable. This is the location in the memory. And then if you perform uh, mean on y, and then uh, we get this tensor and this stores all the history of the operation, gradient function. Okay, the last one was averaging and another. Okay, so this is another uh, location. So the variable class, Okay, keeps track of all the operations that has been done to the data, and it does it by storing specific uh, okay operation in some memory locations. Here, for example, this is another one memory location, another memory location. Here, okay, multiplication, mean, and all right. So X is our tensor, and then dot grad should con uh, contain our gradients. So it's empty now because we didn't calculate the gradient. So these are X. And how well, the last variable that has been created is Z, right? Based on Y was created by the following operations. And then Z was created on, on this, right? So it's a chain of operations. So Z backward performs backpropagation. Basically uh, get the gradient of our function with respect to these uh, x. Now we have the gradient. So basically Autograd performs gradient cal calculations automatically. And it keeps track of all the operation that has been done to the data. And this uh, the z dot backward performs basically back propagation or gradient calculation.
Yeah, there are some other uh, helpful libraries, again, transforms or data sets, modules in this uh, torch vision. For example, data sets, uh, it comes from, it has, uh, let me see. So this is a data set module. So look, it has the following data set, CIFAR, uh, Coco captions, EMNIST, Fashion EMNIST. Okay, this is different data sets. Okay, so you can, for example, from EMNIST, Fashion EMNIST, right? So this is a Fashion EMNIST. So, you know, it's like in scikit-learn, right? In scikit-learn, we, scikit-learn comes with uh, data sets uh, ready to use. In PyTorch also, we have some data sets that we can use uh, without any, you know, separate download, I mean, downloading from internet, bringing it to some format that can be used. <clears throat> so we are getting the MD state set, right? And MNIST, MNIST, okay. So data loader is another module. What it does, it loads the data. So in particular, it automatically allows us to batch I mean, perform the batching of the data. What is a batch? Uh, did I explain what's a batch parameter? So in stochastic gradient descent, we usually, in simple one, we uh, batch size is equal to one. But in, okay, minimum batch gradient, stochastic gradient descent, batch size is how many, given the entire training or data set, how many of them we will select at each iteration and then pass. For example, so, Assume that we have, okay, these 640 uh, examples, right? We're not passing all the 640 examples at once through the entire neural network, but we are passing it for, okay, uh, for 10 times, 10 loops. At each time, we are using 64 selected subset of data sets. Okay, we're passing through the network in batches. It's one of the hyperparameter uh, you know, settings that you need to define. Here, our neural network model, right? This is our neural network. Yes. Um, and we can increase the depth of our neural network if you want, right? So we just need to define, okay, third layer, for example, right? And this will be fourth, right? So here, for example, uh, input 50, output, okay, let's make this 100. Output 100, uh, input 50, output 50. So we now have one, two, for one hidden layer, second hidden layer. And uh, also we need to define x, okay, self fc4 x. And uh, x, so f value rectified linear unit, we're passing through this activation function. So we just increase the uh, depth of neural network. So look, initially, let me not, uh... <clears throat> so initially we had the following neural network. Now we added one more layer. So now we have uh, input layer, hidden layer one, hidden layer two, output layer. In this case, we had input layer, one hidden layer, one output layer. So I suspect that if we increase the hidden layer, it will increase the number of uh, complexity of the model and then increase the VC dimension, right? So it may overfit, but let's try. And uh, neural network module consists of some useful functions such as cross entropy error that we know from logistic regression. And we are using uh, from Optim is a module that consists of, for example, stochastic gradient descent. Implement stochastic gradient descent, 
and with some parameters, okay? So SGD, and we pass network parameters, learning rate, and then optimizer, let's see. All right, <clears throat> now, um, train loader, iter, okay, iterates, gets us one example. This is our first batch, so 64 is the batch size, dimensionality. So optimizer, we need to make sure that first, before starting the training, we need to make sure that uh, the gradients of uh, are all zero. And uh, example, anyway, you, you know, as you work through these examples, it will be much easier for you to understand. So look, this is criterion loss function output. We get the output. We have the target. This is target, uh, the class label of our data set. We compare them and estimate them. All right, the loss. Now, uh, back propagate and optimize that that step means update the weights, okay? And update the weights, but now it's we didn't train it yet. Let's train. So neural network, we use uh, Adam is another version of stochastic gradient descent with, uh, it's also called as adaptive Okay, so a method for stochastic optimizer optimization. It's more adaptive, more updated version of the stochastic gradient this. So epoch, okay, how many times you need to pass the entire train data to the network network? And okay, these are parameters. So now let's try. So we need to use for loop. Okay, so so we are now training. As we see, the loss is going down as we train. We are what we are doing is we are passing. All right, we define epoch. Epoch is one. Okay, we are getting the images from our train loader. Uh, the size of the image every time is sixty-four batch. Okay, sixty-four examples. We are reshaping. You know flattening it to, to make it one tall vector out of image. And, uh, okay, defining this variable when we require the, the gradient calculation, we have this optimizer making it zero gradient and passing to our network, network forward input. Basically, this is, uh, we can also do this, so net input. And calculating the loss function, we have output, we have targets, targets is here, labels, right? And this step is creating cal calculation. So loss backward. Optimizer, optimizer step means update the weights, just like in uh, logistic regression, right? We update that after each iteration. So this optimizer step means update the weights. And here we're starting the loss, and these are just printing. Basically, pass, forward pass, calculate the loss, update, I mean, uh, calculate the gradient. These are four important steps. Or pass, calculate the loss function, uh, calculate the gradient, and update the weight. These are uh, familiar steps, right? We are using here cross entropy loss. Let's see how it's going. So it is going down, all right? Test accuracy is high, all right? Uh, what we are doing here is actually, <clears throat> yeah, so here, accuracy, test, test, uh, okay. Test loader, yeah. From test loader, we, we split the entire data into train and test. Actually, what we're doing here is we are um, not using cross, I mean, validation set. All right, so we're just training and then at each iteration testing. We're not doing cross-validation. So basically, it's easier for us to understand this as a validation data set because tests should be uh, totally unseen and used during the training process.
Okay, after wait update, we are loading test and passing it and then predict, we're using predict, sorry, predict, right? And calculating the accuracy and we are printing that. All right, not sure how long is this going to take, but uh, we can wait a bit more so that uh, this picture should look, uh, yeah, this picture, I mean, this, this is what we should expect. Nine, when you pass nine, nine should be uh, probability. Let's see, oh, okay, we are done. The loop is finished, so the loss function reduced from Okay, this one to this. So interpretation of the cross integral loss function is not straightforward, but we can look at uh, the accuracy. Increase, right? Now, let's load some test data and pass through our network that has been trained. Look, two, we're passing the image two and then the output, okay, probability, okay, is two. Two is being correctly classified, right? Do you see? Nine, nine, okay. So four, four, three, okay. Here three, okay. Some of, I mean, there is some probability it looks like eight, yes, similar, but it's three. Oh no, this is wrong, yeah. So actually this is being treated as two, but it is actually three, it's okay. I mean, sometimes neural network makes mistake. Yeah, this one looks like three. So this is the output of neural network test act on test act is five. Three. So yeah, uh, it looks, you know, neural network works, multi-layer perceptron works well on simple MNIST data set after training, right? Uh, but in this case, if you remember, we, okay, this is not trained neural network. So output is some random number. So the neural network doesn't know. It's acting on uh, random weight. So the probability, look, this is a probability of this input is equally almost likely to be one of those 10 digits. While well, after training the neural network, we see that neural network learned how to correctly identify. All right, do you have any questions? Uh, I'm, I'm going to post these uh, notebooks to the Moodle so you can practice and check yourself, okay? Just, and also I highly recommend to watch those tutorial materials that I have shared. Yeah, so another type of um, neural network architecture, I mean, class of art called convolutional neural networks, okay? Convolutional neural networks. It's very, I mean, similar to multi-layer perceptron, but the architecture is somehow rearranged, but the underlying, the operation is in the product, dot product. Yes, I will upload this file tomorrow. So convolution. So basically, the convolutional neural network uh, doesn't work like we, we don't fit the entire flattened image into the neural network, but we try to define some region of interest and perform convolution operations. So it is uh, it has been shown to work very well for data that has some structure, like images has structure, right? Well defined. So I will explain this later on, okay? But it's also very similar um, to neural networks, but the operation, okay? Okay, here, instead of passing the entire image through the neural network for, uh, after flattening, convolution performs, you know, uh, partial, let's say, dot product computation. We can treat it as a dot product, but it's called as convolution operation between input and then weights and it has similar structure. It's a, not a difficult um, architecture to understand. Yes, I will explain it in next slide, okay? Do you have any questions? So this, uh, okay. This is a PyTorch, a PyTorch crash course. Okay. Um, I think it's uh, from Udacity nano, nano degree. 
So I didn't create them, so I need to give proper credit. Yeah, Udacity. All right. So MIT license, so we can use it, open source, right? As long as we keep the credit. So it was a you know, very quick crash explanation. So you can check, learn. You know, I will post it on the middle. Look, also, you know, in this third notebook, we have this autoencoder that we discussed in our uh, lecture, right? Deep learning. So encoder decoder architecture, right? Uh, I talked about this. So also experiment, try this notebook as well. All right, so it's very interesting.